In the world of true crime, there are mysteries that capture our attention, and then there are those that haunt us for decades. Little Miss Nobody is one of those cases that has defied explanation and lingered in the shadows for a staggering 62 years. But the latest twist in this tale has us both riveted and sobered. Little Miss Nobody is no longer a nameless victim. She is now known by her name, Sharon Lee Gallegos. But first, I want to thank BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. More on that in a minute, but that being said, let's get into it. Picture this, a little girl found alone in the unforgiving Arizona desert, her identity a riddle, and her fate a chilling question mark. For years, her story has been a ghostly presence in the history of unsolved mysteries, leaving investigators stumped and a community in perpetual mourning. But today, we stand at a crossroads of discovery and heartache, as the cold case has thawed just enough to reveal a glimmer of truth. Today, we'll take a deep dive into the perplexing saga of Little Miss Nobody, examining the gravity of her abduction, the eerie circumstances surrounding her murder, and the newfound revelation that has sent shockwaves through the world of crime solving. So join us as we navigate the intricate web of the 62-year-old cold case where casual curiosity meets the sobering reality of a mystery that refuses to be forgotten. We were really overjoyed. We looked into Little Miss Nobody and were amazed at how the people of Prescott and Yavapai County really rallied around her, took care of her for 62 years. It was on July 31st, 1960, and a cool morning in Sandwash Creek, Arizona. A cool breeze washed over the air as residents began their morning. A school teacher from Las Vegas had made his way to Sandwash Creek to look for rocks for his class, and as he was walking, he saw something in the distance. It stood out from the flora and fauna. It was black and charred. When he drew closer, he uncovered the grisly truth, kickstarting a six-decade-long mystery. When the teacher drew nearer, he noticed a small mound of dirt. After lightly brushing the dirt away, he found the crudely and shallowly buried body. The body was small, and he quickly realized it was that of a child. The remains were heavily decomposed due to the Arizona heat and the conditions under which she had been disposed of. Minutes later, the devastated teacher was pointing the Yavapai County Sheriff's Office in the direction of the remains. The county medical examiner's office was not far behind them, and the crime scene investigation began. Officers discovered the remains had been placed in a shallow grave, and the person responsible for dumping and burying the remains had then set them ablaze, perhaps to hide the evidence or make the identification more difficult. Two sets of footprints were found near the makeshift shallow grave, with one of them distinctly belonging to a male adult. Disturbingly, two other mounds of disturbed and charred soil were found, indicating her killer had tried to burn and dispose of the remains twice before settling on a final spot, a detail that remains perplexing to this day. The remains were transported to the Yuvapai County Sheriff's Office, where the heartbreaking autopsy would take place. Medical examiner determined that the remains likely belonged to a Caucasian female aged 2 to 7 years old, although this was later refined to 3 to 6 years old. The girl had brown or auburn hair, was 3 foot 5, and was 50 to around 55 pounds. All of her baby teeth were present and in pristine condition, and there were no signs of trauma to her bones. Given that the remains had been burned and left in the Arizona heat for at least one to two weeks before being discovered, the remains were too decomposed to draw a full conclusion on how the girl had died or exactly when. There were no fractures, healed or new, and due to the nature of her discovery, the case was marked as a homicide. Medical examiner investigators next turned their attention to the clothes that the girl had been found wearing. According to the Doe Network, she was wearing a sunsuit with white or pink shorts, a contrasting blouse with a chain design, and a pair of men's adult flip-flops purposely cut down to her size and affixed to her feet with brown leather straps. Her fingernails and toenails had also been painted red. 
By all accounts, it appeared that the young girl had been physically well looked after, so how had she come to be dumped in a shallow grave next to a creek? Investigators broadcasted information about the girl's discovery across local media outlets, but few viable leads emerged. The discovery of such a young girl dumped in such a callous way deeply affected the community. The community of Prescott came together to raise money for her funeral and headstone. Midway through 1960, the little girl was buried in Mountain View Cemetery in Prescott, Arizona. The headstone that read, Little Miss Nobody, and blessed are the pure in heart. Around 70 people from the local community gathered to remember Little Miss Nobody, a name she would carry for 62 years. Meanwhile, investigators had another clue they had held back from the public. At the scene, they had discovered tire tracks, the first proof that the killer had driven onto the creek from the direction of Highway 93 before parking and finding a spot to dump the young girl. After disposing of her, they jumped back into their vehicle, pulling partway into the desert sand and taking a left, turning and driving away from the site. Unfortunately, it doesn't appear as though investigators were able to determine the make or model of the car from its tire tracks. The footprints had also become a key area of importance for investigators. One pair had been made by an adult, with the other being made by a child in flip-flops, an eerie coincidence to the details of the case. Investigators speculated that the girl was forced to walk to her burial site with the attacker before being buried. Close to the crime scene, the Yavapai County Sheriff's Office found a rusted, bloodstained knife. The knife was sent to the FBI for further testing, but it's unclear whether this was ever conclusively linked to the case. In 1960, DNA testing was not available, so the FBI would only have been able to obtain the blood type from the knife. Whilst this may seem insignificant, it may have helped investigators narrow down their pool of possible victims based on this parameter. Shortly after the details of Little Miss Nobody's case went public, an anonymous witness came forward with a fascinating story. In the days before Little Miss Nobody had been found, he had witnessed a family walking through the desert. The group consisted of a man, a woman, two boys, two girls, and a baby. The witness was able to describe the clothes of one of the girls, which fit the description of Little Miss Nobody's body. The day the witness saw this group was the day before Little Miss Nobody's body had been found. Another witness came forward to have claimed to have seen the same family but this time there was only one girl, two boys, a baby, and the two adults. The witnesses both believed that the family had been transient based on their appearance and commented that they were wearing overalls and cloth caps. Investigators honed in on the transient family and were able to find a family fitting their description in the area. However, despite extensive questioning, nothing ever came of this lead. And like all the others, it eventually fizzled into nothing. There were several possible candidates of missing children that could have possibly been Little Miss Nobody, one of which was four-year-old Sharon Lee Gallegos from Alamangordo, New Mexico. The possibility that Sharon Lee Gallegos was Little Miss Nobody was greatly overlooked when the medical examiner determined that the body had likely belonged to a seven-year-old girl, making her much older than Sharon. In the years that have passed, this number was revised several times based on new analysis. The clothing found on Little Miss Nobody also didn't match the clothes that Sharon had last been wearing when she'd been abducted. Add to this that Sharon had disappeared over 500 miles from Sandwash Creek, and investigators felt hope slipping through their fingers. The final nail in the coffin for this lead were the results of the FBI footprint analysis that were carried out in August 1960. Footprints from Little Miss Nobody and Sharon were compared, and were found to not be the same. After this, investigators were forced to drop this lead and consider other missing girls. Some investigators never let go of this thought, though, and it lingered in their minds for decades to come. After Sharon was ruled out, the case's leads also dried up and the case eventually fell cold. Occasional tips and leads would be called in, but none of them ever led to the identity of Little Miss Nobody. 
and in a devastating blow to the case, the storage area that housed the evidence for the case, which included the knife, the clothing, and other pieces of items collected from the scene, were damaged in a water leak that had gone unnoticed for some time. All of the evidence collected for the case had to be disposed of, and who knows what critical evidence had been lost. The case fell silent until 2015, when the NCMEC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, paid to have the remains exhumed. By this time, the case had garnered attention in online sleuth circles, many of whom had a good idea of who the body belonged to. Little Miss Nobody was exhumed in 2015, and a DNA sample was extracted from the remains. According to Authorm Labs, this sample was able to give them a mitochondrial DNA profile, which was passed down through their maternal lineage. This DNA sample was uploaded to CODIS, and initially no matches were found. Whilst this was a small setback, investigators felt confident that this new DNA evidence would be the key to unlocking the case. In 2018, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children also worked with forensic specialists to create the first ever facial approximation sketch of Little Miss Nobody. After decades of being faceless, the public now had a possibility of what she may have looked like. This new reconstruction was circulated in the media, and soon after, the calls started to roll in. Many believed that the girl in the reconstruction bore a striking resemblance to the abducted child, Sharon Lee Gallegos. Although Sharon had been initially ruled out in August 1960, the Yavapai investigators knew better than to discount the unlikely. The county sheriff's office contacted Othram in 2021 and requested their assistance. Othram used Little Miss Nobody's remains to obtain another DNA profile, despite what they called a substantial degradation and extreme non-human DNA burden. With this new sample, Othram hoped to perform a kinsnap rapid familial testing, which is a DNA test that confirms relationships between siblings. Genealogists have been working hard behind the scenes, using the information obtained by Othram and the public and were able to track down possible siblings of Little Miss Nobody. Thanks to the kinsnap testing, it was only a matter of weeks until the truth could finally be discovered. In March 2022, Othram and the Yavapai County Sheriff's Office held a joint press conference in which they announced that Little Miss Nobody was the missing four-year-old Sharon Lee Gallegos of Alamogordo, New Mexico. On July 21, 1960, just 10 days before her body had been found, Sharon was abducted from the backyard of her grandmother's home. At the time, Sharon was outside playing with her cousins when a man and a woman in a dark green sedan, a 1951 or 1952 Plymouth or Dodge, pulled up to the curb. According to her cousins, a freckle-faced young boy was also in the car, along with another child. The woman first wound down her window, called out to Sharon, asking her to come with them under the promise of sweets and new clothes. Sensing danger, Sharon said no, which only angered the woman. Within seconds, she flew out of the passenger seat, grabbed Sharon by the elbow, and threw her into the car. The vehicle then sped off into the distance before anyone in the Gallegos family were able to react. Sharon was swiftly reported missing and investigators immediately began their search for her. Roadblocks had been set up within minutes of her abduction, and to this day, it remains unclear how Sharon had been spirited out of Alamangordo. Her cousins described the man behind the wheel as white and thin with a long nose and sandy hair. The woman was described as white, short, in her 30s, with dirty blonde hair. In the days before Sharon disappeared, her family had noticed a few bizarre goings-on. At a church service, a woman had been asking about Sharon and her mother, Guadalupe. Days later, the same woman arrived at a neighbor's house, asking probing questions about Sharon and her mother. The woman was keen to know all about Sharon, whether Guadalupe had any other children, and who else lived in their home. There are also reports that Sharon had become timid and withdrawn in the days before her abduction, and had mentioned a dark green car following her. 
Investigators believe that Sharon's kidnappers had planned the attack and had been following her for some time before they struck. But to this day, their identities remain a mystery, as does the identity of the freckle-faced boy who was also in the vehicle. Is he also a John Doe waiting to be uncovered deep in the Arizona desert? While one door in this case is closed, another remains open, and investigators are determined to uncover who did this to Sharon. Why have these people taken her and spent so much time stalking her to only then kill her ten days later? There had always been a hope that Sharon had been out there somewhere, maybe had been abducted to have been raised by another family. Sharon's brother, Roberto Juan Gallegos, had been the one to provide the all-important kinship DNA test, which confirmed the remains belonged to his lost sister. He now resides in Germany. Their parents have since passed, but there remain living aunts, uncles, and many cousins. Those who were still around made a statement to the press expressing their gratitude to bringing Sharon home. How and why she ended up 500 miles away, dressed in different clothes, remain a mystery to both them and the investigators. Her family is also trying to come to terms with the fact that those who took Sharon may have been close to the family or their community. Also made aware of the identification was the last surviving detective who had worked the original case. Now 91 years old, he had been relieved that there had been identification on the case. On October 25, 2022, Sharon's body was interred at the St. Francis de Paula Catholic Church in Telerosa, New Mexico, with the remains of her mother and grandmother who had never given up looking for her. The Little Miss Nobody headstone has been removed, and instead Sharon now has a headstone that bears her name, something she has deserved for over six decades. Sharon's abduction and murder case remain open and active. Anyone with information of the case of Sharon Lee Gallegos is asked to contact the Yavapai County Sheriff's Office at 928-771-3260. As we draw the curtains on the heart-wrenching story of Little Miss Nobody, now known as Sharon Lee Gallegos, we find ourselves at a crossroad of revolution and lingering questions. Sharon's journey from a nameless victim to a beloved daughter, sister, and cousin, whose memory is finally adorned with dignity of her own name, is nothing short of astonishing. The discovery of Sharon's identity brought with it a flood of emotions, relief for her family, validation for the tireless investigators, and renewed sense of hope for justice. But it also left us with a profound sense of sadness as we grapple with the lingering mystery that shroud her abduction and murder. The details of Sharon's tragic story, from her heart-wrenching abduction to the puzzling circumstances surrounding her discovery, have captivated our hearts and minds. Tyler's efforts, investigators, genealogists, and forensic experts have finally pieced together. Why were Sharon's abductors so meticulous in their planning? What drove them to carry out such a heinous act? Who was a freckle-faced boy who was in the dark green sedan with her captors? These questions, like ghostly echoes from the past, remain unanswered. Sharon Lee Gallegos has found her resting place, alongside her mother and grandmother, a poignant reunion after six decades of separation. These questions, like ghostly echoes from the past, remain unanswered. So, what do you think of this mystery? Why do you think Sharon was kidnapped, and what happened in those days following her abduction? If you see anything you want me to cover next, please reach out. I'm always open to suggestions. But, that's it from me. Thank you so much for being here and supporting what I do. I'll see you on the next video. Stay safe out there. Goodbye.